good coaches analyze defeats. Good coaches also analyze victories. They ask that question, why did we win? Uh, when it comes time to think and prepare for the next game, they want to know why they won the last game. Was it, uh, you know, uh, because we did so well, because we had so much more talent than they did, or was it because we didn't really win, they lost, they blew it? Uh, that's the question that uh, good coaches ask. Now, we can always sit and keep it to a sports analogy, but, you know, as important as sports are, it's much more important to succeed at life. I mean, we want to have good victories in life. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. You uh, get on Amazon, get on any kind of website that sells books about success, and you can find just droves of books that will analyze victory. You know, maybe one of the most popular, one of the first, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know, Stephen Covey's book. I mean, great book. I remember uh, about 15 years ago reading a book called Good to Great. Uh, if you haven't read it, great book. Talking about how there's plenty of organizations out there that are good, but sometimes good is the enemy of great. And how do you go from being a good organization to being a great organization? You know, and for us as Christians, as believers, as followers of Jesus, you know, I think all of us deep down in the, the quietness of our heart when we've kind of been able to prioritize really all the urgent things that keep us distracted and busy and going every which way, but when we really peel away the onion and we get down to that core and it's just us and Christ, we don't just want to be good followers of Jesus we want to be great followers of Jesus I don't want to be just a good husband I want to be a great husband I want to be a great father I want to be a great pastor I want to be a great man of God I mean that that's really what I want and I think that's what you want and, and if you've got a relationship with Jesus Christ and you recognize that he died on the cross for your sins and, and you owe everything to him. You don't want to just be good. You want to be great. And you don't want to just have good experiences this week for him. You want to have great experiences. You want to have great spiritual victories. And, and, and I think that that is, is something for us to kind of get in mind because we're going to look at what is probably the greatest military victory in all of Scripture. There's a lot of really, really good ones. So there, you know, someone else might argue and say, oh, no, one of the other ones was a, maybe a little bit better. But this is easily in the top five. This isn't a good victory. This is a great victory. So if you got your Bible, turn to Joshua chapter 10 and we're going to look at this story that is here now we've been walking through the book of Joshua this summer and uh, we've got today and then I've got two more messages that I want to do on uh, on Joshua before we 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 leave it but today we're going to look at Joshua chapter 10 and and in a way this has got to be one of the greatest military victories in all of scripture and, and I don't say that lightly because in the book of Joshua, military victories are spiritual victories. I mean, it, this, was, this was a spiritual experience for Joshua and the children of Israel. They were going into the land that God had given to their forefather 600 years earlier, and they were finally the generation that was mandated with the task of going in and getting it and nobody just stepped aside and said oh hey 
God promised Abraham 600 years ago, why didn't you tell me? You know, hey, let me call the moving trucks. We'll get out of the way. Can you give us till tomorrow afternoon to empty out the house? You can have it. No, those people said, this is our land. And God said, no, it's my land, and I'm giving it to my people. And those were the promises that these Israelites had, this wilderness generation that Joshua was leading. And so every time they went into battle, it wasn't just a military battle. It was a spiritual battle. They were waging spiritual warfare, saying, we are going after the will of God. And so whether it was a bunch of priests that had the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders and they were supposed to step into the Jordan River at flood stages and who knows what in the world's going to happen after that, or whether it was a bunch of soldiers that marched around Jericho silently for seven days and on the seventh day did it seven times and then shouted, I mean, it was all spiritual. I mean, it's the spiritual victories that you should want and that I should want on a regular basis. Because like I said, it's, it's not just that God has called me to be a good this or a good that or a good uh, something else. I mean, I think God has innately put in me this desire to, 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 to not just be good, but to be great. I mean, to, to take his, his, his will for my life, for you to take his will for your life, whether it's being a, an accountant or a teacher or an engineer or a, 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 a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad. I mean, it is, I, this is God's will for my life, and I'm going after it. And I don't just want to be good. I want to be great. And this is a spiritual thing that I'm going after because God has called me to it and I'm going to step up. So we're going to look at this, this, this victory, this battle, because I think it was one of those great ones in all of Scripture. And I think you and I can learn a whole bunch about what we need to be doing to really have or at least position ourselves for God to do the great. Now, chapter 10 is basically a, an extension of chapter 9. Remember last week, the, the, the Gibeonites who were in the land, they came and snookered the Israelites. They said, hey, we're from a long way away. We live a couple hundred miles away and we want to establish a peace treaty with you guys. And that was perfectly fine to do that if they really, in fact, lived a couple hundred miles away. Deuteronomy 20 said it was okay for Israel to enter into those kind of alliances. But the people of the land, they were supposed to utterly destroy them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit. Well, these Gibeonites, who were people of the land pretended to be people from a long way off, they came and the Israelites made a huge blunder. And they signed a peace treaty with them and they entered into it. And then a few days later when they found out that these people weren't a couple hundred miles away, these people were maybe 15 or 20 miles ahead and they could have easily been the next target. I mean, everyone was like, ah. Oh. What do we do now? But the thing that's really cool about it is that the Israelites, even though they swore to God about something that really was going to be a, a major blunder, they had enough integrity to honor it. Well, what happened? Well, look at verse 1 of chapter 10. Now it came about when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and had utterly destroyed it, just as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made a peace treaty with Israel and were within their land. Wow, he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities. 
and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. It's kind of interesting. The, 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 the southern portion of the land was all these little uh, city-states, and Jerusalem was kind of one of the main ones, but there were lots of other city-states around, and they all you know, kind of despised each other, but when they had a common enemy like Israel... They were going to band together. If you remember back at the start of chapter 9, they were kind of organizing an alliance. All of us better get together, or otherwise these Israelites are going to pick us off one after another, like they did to Jericho, like they did to Ai. So why don't we get an alliance going? You know, kind of a, you know, I guess maybe they'd call it uh, something cute like NATO or something, but this was going to be the southern half of the land fighting against the Israelites. But what did the Gibeonites do? What we saw last week. They said, uh, even if you guys all get together, they're still going to kick your tails. And so they went and snookered them and got into a peace treaty. So what does the king of Jerusalem do? He gets everyone together and says, hey, we've got to join forces against Gibeon because if Gibeon and Israel is together, we're really in trouble. Now, you got to make a promise to me. You can't go off Google in this for the next 15 minutes. But let me just tell you something. This is really, really fascinating. You may want to write this down or even take a picture of the screen. You know, in archaeology, if you look for the Arman letters you will find a whole series of letters written by the king of Jerusalem right around in this same era of time where he was writing to Pharaoh and he was writing to other kings. And one of the things he was asking about were these Hebrews. Now, it's interesting. A lot of scholars think that this is an actual outside-the-Bible connection of what's kind of going on in Joshua 10 and 9 and 10, where the king of Jerusalem was kind of saying, hey, we've got these Hebrews coming, and we don't know what to do with them, and we better fight together. And it's like he even wrote off to Pharaoh and said, hey, how'd you guys handle them? And he got this letter back saying, not so well, you know? That's the arm on letters, and uh, it's just... just you know, you may want, want to put some more money in the basket. It's just, just worth your time and energy there. Uh, just food for thought. It's really one of those cool places where archaeology, totally outside the Bible, is just validating some of the stuff that's going on in the Bible. And uh, so back to the story. So the, the, the king of Jerusalem, he pulls all these people together, and what do they do? Verse 4, he says, hey, come up to me and help me and let's go attack Gibeon. For it has made a peace treaty with Joshua and with the sons of Israel. Verse 5, so the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jamath, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, they gathered together and they went up with their armies and camped by Gibeon and fought against it. Well, what does Gibeon do? Hey, we have a peace treaty with Israel. So it's kind of like, you know, if you remember the story of the Alamo, I mean, they're holed up in Gibeon. They're surrounded by these five armies. And so they sent someone out for an SOS. Hey, we need some help. So they sent someone out of Gibeon over to Joshua, who, by the way, is about 20 miles away over in Gilgal. Look at verse 6. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal, 20 miles away, which, I mean, that's a long way away in those days, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. Let's just stop right there. And we saw this last week. This whole peace treaty with the Gibeonites, major blunder. A lot of sin involved. And it was going to be kind of a thorn in their side. 
And, you know, I'm sure that there were several people, maybe Joshua included, who said, wow, all the nations of the south have united together and they want to kill off the Gibeonites. Wow, praise God. We're finally going to get out of this stupid deal that we signed five weeks ago. We can just sit back, take our time, they'll kill them off, and at least that chapter can be closed. But that isn't what they did, is it? Look at the next verse. Verse 7, Joshua, really without even praying... And in this time, it was, it was okay to not pray because he was doing what he knew was to be right because they didn't swear an oath to the Gibeonites. Who did they swear an oath to in chapter 9? They swore an oath to the Lord to protect the Gibeonites. And so Joshua was like, you know what? we got to do it. Verse 7, So Joshua went from Gilgal... He and all the people of war with him and all the valiant warriors. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly. And how did he do it? By marching all night from Gilgal. Now let me stop right there. Okay, Gilgal and Gibeon are 20 miles apart. That's like from here to New Boston. Now, those of you that have been to Israel, you probably also know something. Gibeon, or Gilgal, is at about sea level. Where's Jerusalem? Where's Gibeon? At about 3,500 feet above sea level. They're going to march 20 miles and go up more than 3,000 feet in elevation. Most of you remember that we always take a missions trip to uh, Utah to the ski slopes in March. Uh, we stay at my brother's house down in the valley of Salt Lake, and we usually go ski at uh, one of the resorts up in the mountains. Uh, our favorite one is, is called Brighton. It's roughly from my brother's house up to Brighton, about 20 miles. Salt Lake Valley is at 4,200 feet. The parking lot of Brighton is at 7,000 feet. Now, I can just tell you, if, if at the end of the day, I said to my troop, okay, hey, you know what? Let's just walk to the ski slope. And, and you know, so everyone gather your stuff, and let's start, and, you know, dinner's done we're going to march all night and we're going to go from salt lake up through the canyon all the way to brighton 20 miles and we're going to go uphill nearly 3,000 feet i don't think it, i'd get too many takers but joshua and all those people that's exactly what they did i mean without even batting an eye they went to honor their oath that they had made to God, and they did so in a really difficult way. I mean, you get the news, the news is coming in at 4.30, 5 o'clock. I mean, you'd, send the, you'd think he'd send the SOS out. Okay, tell everyone we're moving out, so it's going to take us a while to pull stuff together, so we're hoping to get on the trail by 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh-uh. Joshua's like, we got to go. Everyone get to their tents. Get your stuff. We're leaving at 515. And they march 20 miles uphill, 3,000 feet. Back to the story. And it's like as, as Joshua does all that, notice verse uh, uh, 8, God is whispering his, in his ear and saying, go get him, buddy. Do not fear. You're going to arrive at daybreak. And I'm sure that when they arrived at daybreak, all those soldiers are saying, can we stop yet? 
we're going we gonna to just rest here, get the lay of the land, and we'll engage the battle tomorrow? Uh-uh. Verse 9, So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal, and the Lord confounded them before Israel, and he slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon. Now think about it. This is the five major city-states of the southern section of the land. One battle, five nations. And God, after these people had pulled an all-nighter, and it wasn't just an all-nighter, it was an all-nighter marching, climbing, God confounds them, and God turns it into a great slaughter. And he pursued them all the way to the ascent of uh, Beth Haran and struck them as far as Azek. And it came about, verse 11, that as they were fleeing from before Israel, while they were descent, while they were at the descent uh, of Beth Haran, that's when God finally got involved in the battle. And, and he starts throwing down these huge hailstones and more people die from the hailstones hitting them than even from the Israelites killing them with their sword and then get this okay they fought all day long they marched all night they fought all day long and then because of what happens next I'm figuring it's probably about 45 minutes to an hour at most before sundown You've seen it. We kind of saw it the other night as we were driving back from uh, Chicago. There was, the, the sun had just gone over the horizon, and the moon was in the sky. And I'm sure that if I'd have been paying attention, if I'd have looked like 20 minutes earlier, the sun would have been there, and the moon would have been there. And, and you know, you only get to see that right in those unique times right before sundown. Well, it was that kind of a day. Because look what happens. Verse 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel, and he said to the son in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon, in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Now think about it. They've marched all night, uphill. They've fought all day long. They've killed a bunch. Major hailstorm comes along, kills a bunch more, maybe even more, even more. But there's still people that need to be taken care of. And Joshua sees the day starting to get away from him, almost got away from him. I mean, literally, for that phenomena to happen, it's got to be like an hour before it's just dark, totally dark. And Joshua, because he wants to finish the task for God, I mean, he looks, and it's almost like he's in his prayer, is commanding the sun to stop and the moon to stop. Now you just think about it. This has got to be the greatest miracle in all of Scripture. I mean, I mean, liberals just laugh at this. I mean, I, I meant to, to Google the, the play about the Scopes trial, uh, whatever the name of that show was, but I remember seeing the movie and I even saw the play where one of the things where they really mock the Bible is this that you're telling me the sun stopped, the moon stopped, the earth stopped on its rotation? No. I'm telling you the universe stopped. 
You think about it. Our universe, what we now know about it, it is this major clock, and, and, and you know, the physicists tell us that it is completely expanding, which I don't, you know, my mind's not big enough for that one. But, but all of this stuff is movement, and there's gravitational pull, and each planet is rotating, and everything, and series of planets are rotating around their, their star, their sun, and and, and galaxies and galaxies and galaxies. And what does Joshua do? Presses the pause button. And, and you look down there, it was paused at the end of verse 13 for almost a whole day. You say, well, how did that happen? I don't know. All I know is that the creator pressed the pause button because he wanted to allow Joshua and his people to finish the job. Look at, look at, look, look at what it says. Verse 13. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and it did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. That is so cool. And you know what? It's interesting. When you really sit and think about it, you say, well, of course there was never a day like this. But notice... He doesn't say there's never been a day like this when the sun stopped and the moon stopped and everything stopped in all the galaxies and all the universe. He said it was never a day like that when the Lord listened to the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. He, 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 he's, he's drawing out something here. It's not just the miracle that is so cool. It's what was going on in Joshua's heart and head and those people that were on the same page with him who were willing, you know, let's just do the numbers, to march all night, 20 miles uphill, 3,000 feet, fight all day long, which meant it probably was like a 12-hour battle or more, and then Joshua presses the pause button and they continue to fight for almost another 24 hours. That's a long time to stay awake and fighting and pursuing God's will. But they were willing to do it. I mean, they were willing to go after it. And if I was to take the time to read the rest of the chapter, and you should, you'll find out. I mean, they chased those people. And they defeated them. And they did what God had told them to do. Let me just press the pause button here. You know, a lot of folks sit and say, no, I, you know, I'm just not really sure about this God of the Old Testament. I cannot get into him. He's killing off everyone. I mean, what about the innocent people? Truth of the matter is there are no innocent people, not even in this room. We are desperately wicked who can know it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God is the creator. He is the potter. And the pot doesn't say to the potter, what are you doing with me? He is the sovereign God of the universe. And, you know, it might make us a little uncomfortable that God is killing off man, woman, and children, even the animals of these pagans. But you know what? Just, just, just a quick answer, and we got to swallow the pill. That's God's prerogative. We serve a sovereign God. You say, well, that's not fair. You're right. We all should be consumed because we've all fallen short of God's glory. I mean, no one can argue with the compassion of God, the grace of God. 
and when it came to the Old Testament and, and Israel's mandate to, to basically exterminate these nations and pagans, I mean, that is God's call. We can't sit and look at it and say, well, I ain't going to worship that kind of God. I mean, what kind of God are you going to worship? The God that, that is made in your image or the God whose image you are made in? He's the creator. And I wish I could talk a lot more about that, but, but that, if, if that's something that troubles you, I mean, let me tell you the quick answer. He's God, you're not. He is absolutely holy, you're not. And that's just one of those things you've got to say, that's his prerogative, and I'm here to do his will. And that's what made this day so unique. Because here is Joshua pursuing the will of God to, to do what God had called them to do. And that is to take care of all those people. And Israel would have been so much better off had they done that consistently. Instead of this being the exception, this should have been the norm. The great thing about this day, according to the writer, is not that the sun stopped and the moon stopped. It's that there was a man and his army that was so zealously passionate about doing God's will that they said God give us another day so we can take care of your business you know when I when I just kind of sit and uh, think through this story and all that's that's there you know I ask myself okay what is the point of this why why did God in his in his wisdom want us to read this story and hear this story what is it that that success generations were supposed to get out of it what are we supposed to get out of it well remember i think one of the things this passage is asking or answering is is why do we win you know we're analyzing a victory how can we have these kinds of moments obviously they're up to god to give them but how can I position myself so that my arms are open and I can receive God's blessing? And I think if you look through this passage, you kind of see the point. And the point is this. There was fervent belief in God's promises. I mean, go back to uh, verse 7 and 8. I mean, Joshua, when he heard about the opportunity... Instead of sitting and saying, oh, man, finally we can get rid of these Gibeonites. This might be easier than I thought to get rid of this little snafu. No, Joshua was like, we swore that we were going to take care of them. And we're going. And so he rallies the people. Hey, we're not leaving in the morning. We're leaving now. Get to your tent. Get your sword. Get your equipment. Be back here in 15 minutes. And all of them did it, and they all were off. And it's almost like he's marching along, leading his people into battle, not for his own sake, not for his own ego, but because he was going to do God's will. And look what God does in verse 8. It's like as he's going along, God whispers in his ear, hey, you got this. I'm going to give this to you. Don't fear. I've given them into your hands. Not one of them's going to stand before you. And Joshua's like, yeah, I got it. We're going. He was so fervently believing what God had said, he was out the door before his wife even knew what was going on. And so were all those soldiers. You know what the other thing that you see throughout this passage? I mean, there is fanatical. And I searched for that word and thought, no, that's the right word. Fanatical obedience to God's precepts. You know what? Those people had hearts. Those people thought just like us. And I'm sure there's many of them that sat and thought, really, we got to kill all of them? I mean, 
what'd that baby do? What'd that child do? What'd that woman do? She didn't know who she was married to. Those old people, they're just old people. We got to respect the old people. I mean, those people were fanatical in going after what God told them to do. And I think that one of the reasons this turns out to be the greatest miracle in all of Scripture, like the writer said, a day like no other day before it or since. Not because God stopped the sun and the moon, cool as that is, great as that is, bigger and better than, quite frankly, with all due respect, just making a dead person come back to life. The biggest miracle, the biggest act of God, is that finally, for a moment, God's people all got passionate and fanatical about believing him and doing what he says. You want to see God work in your life? Check your belief and check your obedience. Trust and obey. It's really what it boils down to. I want to see God work. I don't want to be good. I want to be great. And what God is saying, you know what, Richard? Trust me and obey me. And if I choose to stop the sun and the moon so that you can be a better this or a better that or more thoroughly obedient to me and finish the task, I'll take care of it. But what I'm expecting from you is someone that says, I'm all in. I'm all in in my trust, and I'm all in with my obedience. You know, this is a great transition time of year. You know, in, you get into August, and even if you don't have kids in school, even if you never even had kids, for some reason, it's like life begins September. You know, September 1st really ought to be the start of the new year, it seems like, for almost all of us. And this, this is just a good time for us to sit and say, okay, what am I going to do differently? What is it that God's calling me to do differently in this new season? And the answer is, whatever it is, I need to be all in. I need to zealously believe that God's call on my life is it. And that's, I'm, I'm all for it. And I am going to be fanatical about doing what he's told me to do. Let's pray. Lord, I, I just thank you for this incredible story. And I thank you for Joshua and his incredible belief and obedience. And I thank you that all his people got on the same page. Lord, I, I pray that we would be on that page. We don't want to be good. We want to be great. Not for ourselves, but for you. Father, there's folks here that are getting ready to go back into classrooms and teach kids. They want to be great teachers who are your person in that classroom. I pray, Father, you would give them the, the faith, the trust, the obedience. Father, there's people here that design things, sell things, support things. Uh, we don't want to be just good. We want to be great for you. We don't just want to be a, a Christian worker. We want to be someone that is so shining brightly to this very dark community that uh, we've got a God that uh, is worthy of our trust and worthy of our obedience. Father, I pray too, if there's someone here that does not know you, 
and they hear this and it's just like they're not really sure how it's all connecting Father I pray that uh, even right now they would recognize that Jesus Christ is their Savior and through simple faith and trust they can believe on him and be saved and have this relationship with you that, that just can be the most exciting journey sun stopping journey moon stopping journey to be your people in this place so Lord thank you for the truths we've seen today it's in Christ's name Amen